Hey, how are you? I'm Slice Botaku, and it is time for our episode review of Moon the Undaunted. This episode is something heavy, something fierce, so I just want to get right into it. Alright, so first, right off the bat, we see a Septarian, what we can presume to be a Septarian, sweeping up some skulls, which we can also presume to be Muman skulls. And this instantly paints an ugly picture of these creatures, but you have to remember that there is bloodshed on both sides. And this sort of gives us a better idea of what Septarians can actually look like. Some of them have horns or just bone protrusions from their tails, so maybe that's something to keep in mind if we are to recognize this species in the future. And so I immediately think back to Ludo's original design, the sort of skeletal headpiece he once wore. This looks now like it could have been a Septarian in its lifetime. So yeah, that's definitely an interesting callback, and I'm curious if that has any other meaning besides that. Um, but also, we are able to see a sort of skeletal headpiece in this background. So yeah, I feel as though there are still many questions to be asked when it comes to this septarian species. We've only just begun. And we as the viewers are to see this as a dangerous situation. These monster forces are incredibly close to this Mumin kingdom. And you have to remember that monsters by default are a lot more physically inclined and powerful than simple Mumins. I mean, the Butterfly Royal Family are able to access magic, but we haven't seen this from any other Mumins. It doesn't seem like that's a normal thing for them. They rely upon the magic of the Queens of Muni. They are their protectors. And so what the Mumins have going for them is civilization. They have each other and they have a sort of system. They are organized. Whereas monsters typically are not and that's how they're able to thwart them. But here, we see monsters mobilizing together. They are working together simultaneously and that is a great danger to human society and their overall dominance. From there, we quickly jet into the bedroom of a young moon. And I mean, her resemblance to her daughter is impeccable. If you simply just did a little bit of simple editing to this character, when compared to Star in the episode Into the Wand, she could pass as an identical twin. And if there's anything worth noting in this room, it would be that small banner in the upper left corner. It looks to be a previous Queen of Muni. Uh, I, I'm not sure if we will ever see this queen in any other sort of media, but as a lore whore, I love things like this. Just even insignificant stuff, I just love it. It really reminds me of Avatar The Last Airbender where we got to see the previous avatars. Like, I live for that. But yes, Moon is mourning the death of her mother, who we know was killed by Toffee and his monsters. And we actually get to see a picture of Moon's unnamed mother and Moon herself as a little kid. And this is a rather simple image, but there are some things that I want to mention. Firstly, the way that Moon looks up at her mother, she admires her mother so much. It's pretty much being conveyed that she just adored her mother. And that just drives the feelings of her losing her even further home. Which segues into my next point, her hair. The way that Moon's mother wore her hair as a queen. Um, if you notice, in the other depictions of queens, they can wear their hair however they want to. But Moon chose to wear her hair in the same way as her mother. It's sort of like her homage to her mother. And that's some powerful stuff. And lastly, her cheek marks are butterflies, which I want you to remember for a future reference. But anyways, as Moon is looking at this photo, she is interrupted by Count Mildrew. And Count Mildrew is like your typical Prince Charming from like old Disney films that has been just like casted away, but he's here. And although he asks her how she's feeling, he doesn't listen to her at all. He just makes assumptions as to how she should feel and what he presumes she's feeling. And that situation seemed pretty awkward, so luckily as the now seated Queen of Muni, Moon was called into the Situation Room. And in here we have a monster who is chained up and is swearing up and down that he did not order whatever they assume he ordered. And Mina is just beating on him, telling him that he needs to shut up during his confession. Moon goes into the room and asks Mina what's going on, and as she comes to sit, Count Mildrew pulls out her chair for her, and Moon is not really feeling that at all, so she pushes the chair back up, 
and takes it out herself like a capable person. And it's not like Chivalry is dead or anything like that, but based on Count Mildrew's behavior before, I give Queen Moon a total pass. I understand. Like, I don't like this guy's vibe at all. And around this table, we have the Magical High Commission, someone we can presume to be a general of some sorts. I don't recognize him. Maybe we've seen him before. Excuse me. Um, we have Count Mildrew, and I'm just wondering, what does Mildrew do? Is he still in the picture? I want to know if he is a thing that we will see in the future or if something happened to him or whatever. Because, I mean, it's pretty obvious that Moon didn't pick this guy to be her partner. And once again, this guy who can presume to be a monster royal. Now, we don't learn an abundant amount of information about this character in particular, but I still hold on to my belief that he is related to Baby in some way, shape, or form. I mean, the design choices are way too similar for there not to be something there. But yeah, Mina explains in a very wacky and zany way that one of this monster royal servants made off with half of an army and killed Moon's mother. And I just have to say that Mina has not aged a single day. Yes, she's now dirty and just weird. I mean, she's always been weird, which we can presume by this, but she has not aged at all. What is the deal with that? There has to be some reason behind that because Moon is star's age at this time and she goes on to be a full-fledged adult. Mina is just holding on to her youth. Like, that's weird. But yeah, the Monster Royal reiterates that him and the former queen were about to sign a peace treaty when one of his generals went rogue. This general being known as the Lizard. And from here, the entirety of the room erupts in just a argument as to whether or not they should go to war or sign the peace treaty. Now to me, considering the lizard has amassed half of an army, a peace treaty isn't going to resolve all of their problems. They will still have to go to war. Because obviously Toffee and many others did not agree with this at all. And so it doesn't matter what path Moon would choose among these two, there would still be suffering amongst them. And they all sort of belittle Moon's placement at this table. They treat her like a princess who is not ready for the real action and she's just trying to make a clear and rational decision. And a young river actually pulls through, he actually says something useful, he says that they should let Moon decide, she is the queen after all. And once again, this guy, Count Mildrew, I don't like him. Once again, he just belittles not only Queen Moon, but River by saying that she needs to deal with her feelings. She just lost her mother. And I get that he's trying to be sympathetic, but he's not asking for how she actually feels about all this. But anyways, Queen Moon says that she will come to her decision at dawn. And after this whole thing, she is approached by River who gives her an apology meet, which is how Johansson say that they're sorry apparently. But yeah, it's nice to see these two in their youth and how they got close to each other or whatever. Just the inklings of their relationship is nice to see here. But anyways, Moon returns to her room and there is the magical book of spells and there's a noise coming from it. And she unlocks it to see a crying Glosseric. Not just a crying Glosseric, but a depressed, weeping Glosseric. And this young queen Moon calls him Glossy. And I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's just so wild to me that they had a relationship to where she called him glossy and, and, and she's not just being nice to him. Like, it seems like this is her normal way of speaking to him. So wh what happened to the shift? Why did he go from glossy to glossaric? Like, wh what happened? <laughs> And I mean, we know that River doesn't like Glosseric, so I want to know if there's any history between the two of them. But yeah, um, Glosseric says that he's not okay because her mother is gone. So Glosseric really does have feelings for these queens. Like, he does form a connection with them despite what he may say under certain context. He does love these queens, or at least Queen Moon's mother. And I want you to keep in mind how they contrast the feelings of Moon and Glosseric. Now, Glosseric is just weeping. He doesn't know what to do with himself. But Queen Moon is here trying to come to a decision. She's trying to figure things out. She doesn't know what to do. And thus far, we have yet to see her cry. So 
I think that Glossaric is placed here to show that even Glossaric, the person who sometimes comes across as a ne'er-do-well who has no feelings, is here just breaking down, whereas Moon is not wavering. And Queen Moon asks for Glossaric's opinion on the matter, and he is just not in any condition to help her, and tells her to just pick one because he's sure that it'll just work out. Yeah, he's not in any condition to give advice, so he just ends up crying in Queen Moon's mother's chapter, which unintentionally or intentionally opens up to Queen Eclipse's forbidden chapter, which leads her to go and see a crystallized Eclipse. Eclipse is alive and she knows that, so she contacts Romulus. And we get to see Eclipsa in the flesh for the very first time. Now Queen Moon is on guard. She has her wand up ready for whatever crazy evil darkness that Eclipsa is about to unleash. And for a while there, Eclipsa is not moving. And then she begins to breathe in and breathe out. And then she collapses to the point where Queen Moon is scared that she killed her. But then... You hear something faint, you hear something very, like a whisper, hushed whisper. And she's saying, before, 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 and you're just like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? What's happening? But she's actually gesturing for Moon to go to the vending machine and bring her the snack labeled under B4. Now, you and I, we need to talk. Did I not predict in my prediction video for all the promos of Star vs. the Force of Evil, did I not put emphasis on the snookers? Did I not say that we could live off of snookers? What do we have here? Eclipsa, the baddest queen who has ever existed, needs snookers the moment she emerges. I, 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 I cannot believe how powerful I am, my intuition, my theorizing, I don't know how I do it, but I understand now that nobody can touch me because I, I know nobody was putting emphasis on the snookers besides me. The snookers are the real power of Star vs. the Force of Evil. The most powerful, baddest mamma jamma in this entire series is a snookers fan. I'm sorry, like, <laughs> this is probably the least most impressive thing like I shouldn't even be losing my mind over this but I gotta tell you when I was watching this episode and I saw the snookers bar be what she wanted I, I lost it because like I just made a one-off joke about snookers and here we are snookers are a thing that Eclipsa the baddest 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 woman wants but yeah enough of that um Eclipsa actually wants to hold the snookers bar on her own so she just drags her own hand out of this crystal and we see just ugh, just I don't even know she's just she just looks corrupted herself and so she asks how long she's been here how long she's been crystallized for and Moon replies for 300 years and I want to tell you that throughout this entire interaction with Eclipsa she will give you every reason not to fear her but when she says 300 years to her she is sort of taken back and then proceeds to eat the chocolate, like doesn't really even care. And that just makes me scared of this woman. She doesn't even care about how long she's been here, really. I mean, that sort of revelation would just break so many people. Think about it. Everyone you have ever known is dead. Everyone is gone. Everyone you've ever cared about is dead. So for this woman to just be like, oh, OK, just keep eating our snookers bar. She doesn't care. She, she does not care, and that is terrifying to me. And because of the wand and crown, Eclipsa recognizes Moon to be the Queen of Muni. And she also notes how she's too young to be the Queen of Muni, unless her mother, is she dead? And she asks this, which is the first time we see Queen Moon cry over this. And you gotta put yourself in the shoes of a young Moon. Eclipsa, as bad and terrible as everyone says she is, is still her family member this is still like her grandmother great great whatever whatever this is still one of her grandmothers so she kind of immediately is a lot more comfortable with her to where she is able to express her feelings and eclipsa also remarks that she lost her mother too when she wasn't much older than moon and she is crying over this and this is a historical event so i don't think that she's lying 
but I think that the context may be a bit different. The two things that I am immediately thinking of is one, her mother died and that's why she's just so different. Like she just decided to do things so differently. Maybe humans killed her mother and not monsters, something like that. Or she is the reason why her mother died. That would be insane. That would just like make everything crazy because I, I mean, she can cry over it because of like, oh, my mom, she didn't see eye to eye with me. Oh, it sucks, but I had to kill her. Oh, well, I don't know. I, I don't think that we can afford to let our guard down around Eclipsa as much as this episode will make you think that you should. No, she is still the queen of darkness. But because Eclipsa also opens up, Moon feels even more comfortable and lets her know that everyone is expecting her to make these huge decisions, but she's just a kid. She doesn't even know which boy she likes, so how can she lead a nation? But then she elaborates that she's not just here for a conversation. She's here for Eclipsa to teach her one of the spells from her forbidden chapter. And Eclipsa is just like, forbidden? That's what they're calling my chapter now, really? Which was a moment that I like because a villain doesn't always necessarily view themselves to be a villain. They don't see what they're doing as wrong. And I feel as though that may have illustrated that for Eclipsa, what she is doing, her belief in monsters and things like that is not something that she does to be malicious, to be evil, to be deemed as a threat. She just sees things differently and maybe she's radical with it. Maybe she's an extremist. But yeah, maybe she thinks everyone else is crazy. But anyways, Moon asks for a spell that can kill an immortal. And Eclipsa asks if that's really what she wants because the spell that she's asking for requires a magical contract. One that she can provide under the condition that once her opponent is killed, that Eclipsa gets something in return. That thing being her freedom. And Moon is just like, what? Are you serious? Which causes Eclipsa to say, oh, I just want to buy my own chocolates and little muffins at the bottom. Which once again, like that, if nothing else proved to you that she's playing games here, that she's trying to fool Moon, then that should, because really, the Queen of Darkness wants to be released so she can get her own muffins, really. But Moon says that these are Romulus's crystals, how can she free her? And Eclipsa elaborates that a contract between two queens is far stronger than any crystal. And so maybe that's something to keep in mind for the future of Star and Moon. Let's say Star somehow becomes the queen of Muni while Moon is still alive later on in the story, what role would that have to play? But yeah, Moon does make this contract with Eclipsa. They shake hands and this darkness starts to wrap around her. Both of their cheek marks begin to glow and then it's over. Eclipsa then whispers the spell into Moon's ear and then Moon is told to aim it directly at his heart. And as soon as she says that, Romulus just encloses her back into the crystal. And Moon says that she didn't really seem all that evil. We're then ever so quickly taken back into the situation room where that one guy who I don't really recognize, I don't remember him from any other episode says, the queen is light. And it's like once again with the disrespect, it if Moon heard that, it would be off with that man's head. But anyways, outside, Moon is riding on a little Chauncey towards Toffee's camp. And this jerk, Count Mildrew, is just writing her off as crazy and presuming her to be dead. And River believes in her. He's not ready to just write her off as dead just yet. But anyways, we now enter this camp of militant monsters. And notice how not all of them are septarian. They are just... A mixed bag of monsters, but there are Septarians among their ranks. Anyways, Moon sits down before them and is just eating the apology meat that River gave her. And they're just like, can we help you? What, what are you doing? And she asks to speak with the general. And they all just begin to laugh when Toffee is just like silence and quiets them all down. Now Toffee, the general, the lizard, he is a savage. He busts out out of a just a curtain of skulls and on his shoulders he has what can be presumed to be Mewin skulls now before I believe this to be uh, Queen Moon's mother but we now know that her cheek marks are 
of a butterfly and we already know Eclipse is alive but you have to remember that there are other butterflies there are other members of the butterfly family who are not in line to be royal so I don't doubt that these skulls are real but for them to be Mumin royalty I don't think so and really as morbid as it would have been I would have liked him to use Queen Moon's mother's skull on his shoulders because I mean skulls already litter the place and if you're gonna do that then why not go all the way with it but it's all right it's all good because anyways it's really cool to see Toffee out of his business attire to see him dress up as a general in his younger days and I mean he seems to be being polite to her by saying hello princess but in reality that's actually meant to be a jab at her because we know that he's responsible for her mother's death so he knows that she is actually the queen now but he still regards her as princess to sort of belittle her it's very subtle but exactly what i would expect from a sort of businessman like toffee and when moon makes the presumption that he is the lizard toffee replies that she can just call him toffee and she's she's just like taken back by this toffee what's the difference i mean that's a weird name right but he just asks her what does she want what is she doing here and she says that he needs to leave she just wants him and his army to pack up and go and they're just like your mom couldn't defeat us so what are you gonna do little princess really like what are you capable of if your mother couldn't take us out and i mean remember Moon has this spell at her disposal. She could have just shot them on sight. As soon as she got there, she could have just shot them. Um, but she doesn't. She sits down and is civil. She speaks to them and gives them a chance. Despite them killing her mother, she gives them a chance. And that just shows the character of Moon, which I'm going to talk about at the end of this video a lot more. Oh yeah, and I almost forgot to mention that Rastacor is here and he's just ready to show his septarian dominance. And so he has a fellow monster bite off his arm and then he just brings it right back to show his power and to kind of remind the audience what we're up against. And I mean the monsters just love this. Like this, you gotta think, as a monster, you have to be so happy that the, this is a thing, that they are powerful. because. For your entire existence, you feel powerless, you feel below the Mumins, but you have a chance now. These are your saviors. But anyways, Moon begins to recite her spell, and it is just dope. Like, this entire sequence is so cool. But yeah, Toffee is not phased, and he is just like, enough of this, this needs to end. And Moon proceeds to shoot off his finger. Now, let's just think about how level-headed Moon actually is, like especially in comparison to her daughter Star. Now, she recognizes that to kill Toffee is to unleash the darkness of Eclipsa, to let her roam free once again. So she doesn't use this spell to kill Toffee, she uses it as a warning shot, which is impressive. And when Toffee's finger does not grow back, it throws the entire monster army into disarray because once again, the Septarians are sort of their saving grace, they're, they're heroes. So for them now to be as vulnerable and weak as them, it's absolutely terrifying and now they have no hope so they just run off. And when this happens, Toffee just takes the L, he brushes himself off, looks at her upset, but he walks away. So the story isn't exactly how it was depicted in her painting. But it's still just as, if not more, impressive. But yeah, once Toffee is gone, River rushes over and hugs her, congratulating her, saying that you did it. And Moon is just so happy to have someone, you know, embracing her over this. And then the Magical High Commission, along with everyone else who was in the Situation Room, also comes out and asks, what did she just do? And based on their expressions and Romulus's tone, it's clear that they were ready to scold her. But she says, no, I was doing my job, and as your queen, I will continue to do my job of protecting this kingdom. I will scatter the remains of the monster army without country and leadership. And <laughs> this is why she is known as Moon the Undaunted, because you have to think about the perspective of all of her subjects. Moments ago, she lost her mother. Her mother was killed by Tothi and his forces. And not once did they see her cry, not once did they see her despair. She said that she was gonna figure something out 
and she went and did it. She took them all out in one fell swoop, instantly, by herself. And so in their eyes, never once did she waver. She is such a powerful influence. And so when we compare her at this age to Star, yes, Star is more magically inclined and powerful in that aspect, but for the Mumin people, Moon is almost like the perfect leader. She is an incredible leader to them. And so this is a facet that Star will have to develop and grow in a lot more if she ever plans to reach the same level as her mother when it comes to leading her people. But yeah, the last thing is Moon asks if anyone has any questions and nobody questions her. They all bow down. This is power. This is incredible. This is Moon the Undaunted. Guys, I really hope that you enjoyed this video, this in-depth breakdown. Like this is a long one because I just had so many things that I wanted to say because there were a lot of subtle aspects of this episode that I felt needed to be covered. And so I really hope that you appreciate that. I think that this is one of my favorite episodes of Star Versus because this really does make you love Moon so much more. And I mean, there's more to come from Moon in the rest of season three, but just this episode, I mean, she was her own main character. I mean, I, I love this so much and hopefully you feel the same. Thank you all so much for watching and have an awesome day. I love you.